only day all right so are you ready for this i see cam i see you there you're in the green room and we're just ready to welcome cameron shell so cameron you are in the green room you are the co-founder and ceo of big you are a tedx speaker cameron shell is considered a serial entrepreneur with his first ventures beginning at the age of 14 and in business that spans more than 25 years. He is the co-founder and CEO of Business Instincts Group, which is big, and Build Impossible. He has launched numerous successful tech startups such as Dragonfly Innovations, Cold Bore Technologies, Raptor Rig, Kodak One, and Currency Works. His entrepreneurial success is based on principles of clear vision, Again, that word vision, so, so important, quantifiable results and a tireless pursuit of goals. In 2016, his project Earthcast was awarded the number one technology company by Deloitte for the creation of the first ever live video of Earth. Super, super incredible. A sought after speaker, Cameron has addressed audiences of thousands and settings around the world. And today, Cameron, uh, we're virtual. We've got Canada, we've got the US, we've got Africa, we've got the UK, we've got the whole world in our hands. Uh, you've done presentations, Cameron, including speeches at the United Nations, Tony Robbins, yeah, uh, same, TEDx yeah, Montreal yeah. Women, and your talks have touched on themes ranging from technology to the homeless. And, he, and you share your experiences of overcoming hurdles, the impossible. You're a thought leader uh, based on not just business experiences, but only life experiences. And that is why we're bringing you on the show today is because you have done it all. You have uh, not just seen a jet set uh, lifestyle made as a self-made multimillionaire, but you lost it all then you got it all back again after the 9 11 attacks in 2001 you're at the towers you've experienced firsthand the world trade center that pause was on purpose because i think everybody remembers that time and that is when you began your battle with addiction cameron if you're in the green room i'd love you to join our live session it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you to the success summit and i see cameron your picture is mid so if we can get you I, I can't see your face i can see your beautiful photo <laughs> oh really i uh I, oh okay great little delay there sorry about that that's okay hello my friend oh and my you gosh have to say thank you for being a support her and i don't know if you know much even about what a support her is but you lead that it's supporting a woman in her network her workplace and her community and I just have to say thank you for showing us so much love by being you know helping spread the word about our success summit and you know right up until the last tweet I see you liking tweeting doing all that stuff uh, you and your team are rock stars so I'm really excited to have you to give this keynote and my friend the stage is yours um, you're so so gracious that introduction was way over the top and much and, and much better than the story I'm going to tell right now. So thank you so much, and thanks for the work that that you folks are doing. Um, it uh, you know the uh, it was it was probably 20 years ago uh, a time one of the times I got to speak at the United Nations, and it, and it was all we, we were providing computers to women in Africa because they are the primary breadwinners. They are the ones that will drive the economy, and it's just an incredible time to see everything from. Me Too unfolding to uh, the the positive and proactive, um, I, I would call it almost you know uh, affirmative action of seeing women on boards. Um, the, all all of this that like the, the balance that it, I believe that in fact the, the turmoil and the upheaval that we're seeing right now is part of the balance that's that uh, that's being put in place. Um, in particular, I think uh, by women and minorities. Um, and a lot of it started with me too. And a lot of it started because of the types of these types of things. It started because of social media. It started because of transparency. It started because we could do a conference like this. It can, and you don't have to spend thousands of dollars to get somewhere. You don't have to spend 
be of a certain uh, socioeconomic class. I mean, anybody can get on this thing and participate and be active. And I think the, these are the barriers of entry that are really coming down in our society and making absolutely anything possible on a global level. I'm not deterred at all by what's happening right now. I'm more excited and, and more impassioned and more just absolutely deeply moved about what we see happening up there in this world mm -hmm. today. Uh, the, the only other time I remember when I was young, when the, when the, when the wall was coming down in Berlin, I remember that being a really impactful time. But to be able to go around, uh, I live in Venice Beach, California, and to be able to go around and see the demonstrations that have been taken back from the rioters, like not, not only the fact that they're happening, but the fact that they are happening in spite of the professional protesters and that they're being taken back by the people that care about the causes at hand. And that it's not unsafe. Like oh, two weeks ago, you know, I was like, geez, do I have my kids outside? And, and today it's like, no, my kids get to go to the demonstrations. I mean, that that is, I, I think, un, unprecedented. I have a very strong mentor who said the only time in history that he's aware of, and he's a very learned man, that protests ended the war was in Vietnam. And, uh, and there was a particular massacre in a village at that time, and that was the one that just pushed the American to the top. And I'm not trying to uh, give my politics around Vietnam or not or anything like that, but simply as an example that that is the level of movement that's happening here today. And, and out of that, you know, comes a stronger democratic uh, society. So I'm, anyway, but not, not the exact topic for today, but I really, really, yeah, but I think it is completely tied into the types of things that you guys are doing here. So thank you so much for just allowing me to be a part of it. I'm completely honored uh, to, uh, to be here today. And um, what, what I get to share on and what you've allowed me to share on is something that I think everybody uh, basically faces every single day. And um, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, you know, black or white or Hispanic or male or female, um, but it's self-doubt and it's overwhelm. And, and these are these, when I really break down a lot of my life journey, it's always been about, okay, how am I dealing with self-doubt or overwhelm? Because, because if, I, if I didn't have either of those, and if I didn't, like, I understand how powerful they are today and why they're important in my life. But if there was, if I absolutely knew I couldn't fail, what would I try to go to? And, um, you, you know, I've tried to live my life that way and it was a disaster. Until, until I understood a few key principles about what not failing means. And, that, and that's what you're allowing me to, to share with you uh, today. But there is a simple formula, if you will. There is a simple process, um, at least one that, that's worked for me and a lot of people I get to work with, that, that continually demonstrates that nothing's impossible or that you can overcome uh, anything. And there are some things that are like in typical fashion overcomable, but uh, out of, you, you know, you know, death sentences with cancer or, you know, really, really tragic events. But there is nothing that's, impo that's impossible that can come out of those things. And so um, a, 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 a slight bit of background. Um, I, uh, today, I, I'm very fortunate. I get to live in California with my family, get to work down here. Um, but I, I come from a very small town in Southern Alberta farming community. Uh, I didn't finish high school. Uh, I, uh, I come from an entrepreneurial uh, and and uh, yeah, ranching uh, background family, and um, and and so I just I went to work because that's that's just kind of what you did, and um, uh, it's interesting. I, I have a son that uh, went to college <clears throat> last year. And he was a very good student, which blew me away, and and he didn't stay in school. And and I was I was, I was perplexed. I was like, he was a good student, but he didn't stay in school. And t today he's he's a realtor. He's <laughs> dude, he's crushing it. He's he's learning. He's growing. He's you know, and it's he's just not it's just not meant to, to be for him. And more and more, I think that'll that'll tend to be the case. And I was not advocating not for education. But that said, uh, I didn't I didn't finish high school. Um, when I was 26, however, uh, I was the CEO of a company that had a, over a three billion dollar valuation on the Nasdaq. And at, at, it was during the dot com startup days. Uh, we we were a company that was in significant revenue, uh, right around the hundred million dollar mark. And we had created what is now known as the cloud computing industry. Back then it was called the application service provider industry. And we were the, the first company to take Microsoft products and put them on servers and serve them up over the internet so people could access and use things like Microsoft Word uh, remotely. Like the things that we just do today that we just take, take for granted. So this is 25 years ago. And, um, but, you know, uh, just because I had reached a, you know, some level of quote unquote success at that time, um, and, and I had a, a couple of other projects in the interim as well. Uh, when I was uh, 35, I was at the base of the World Trade Center. 
And, uh, you know, I've told the story before that that night, that day, my life changed. And, but upon reflection, you know, that, that day I woke up, that, that day, the turmoil that it seems like hurt that we see in society today is the same experience I had as, a, as an individual, but it's something that I had to face and finally go through. Um, you, you know, I was living a life that was not necessarily principle based. I was living a life that was all about ego and, and really a big part of self-centeredness and, and all the things that we see driving, you know, a certain part and component of our society. Uh, today that I think is going through a big, big upheaval and, and healing process. And again, I'll say it again in large part because of the empowerment of women's movements like this. It is that empathetic side. It is that, it is that, it is the soft logic. No, no decision can be made without emotion. That's been proven over and over again. And uh, in general, men try to do that. And, and, and we need, we need that intuitive influence uh, in our society. And so how that relates specifically to what uh, happened with me was um, that really just became my excuse. That became uh, a pivotal point in my life where that was the first night that I had consciously decided that I was going to go out and drink. Um, I've been a social drinker before, but not that, but I was going to go drink that night. And, and I did. And you know, I just have that personality that, you know, six months later, you know, I, I was a full on, you know, addict in real trouble. And, and inside of a year, I was, you know, maybe a year and a half, I was homeless. And, and how you can go from that, you know, quote unquote wealth that I had to homeless in such a short period of time is, you know, it's the addict's journey because you just ignore everything else. You just, there is nothing else that matters other than, you know, the next 10 minutes. And so everything in my life completely dropped. But so that's at 35, um, through, through a lot of luck, and I would like to say hard work, but the reality is it was a lot of luck and a lot of other people's love. At 42, I, I was finally clean. And this isn't like, oh, I decided to get clean or there, there's no, it was like, it was, um, I've been fortunate enough to tell the story before. It was a circumstance that got me lucky. The, the addict out there will never quit using because there's something better. The addict out there will only stop using if there's no way to get any more to get high anymore, whether it's, there's no access to drugs, period, in the story, which eventually there always is again, or if it just stops working, right? And, and believe me, if, if, if an addict could choose between death, uh, homelessness, uh, or, or, or just not having to use again, they'll check death, they'll take death and homelessness every single day. The only reason that I have found that they will stop using is that it stops working, right? I can't get high anymore. And, and there's lots of different reasons why you can't get high anymore. But until that happens and until they're going, like, it just isn't working anymore, they will, they just will never quit. That it is not willpower. It's not strength. It is that, it is that moment of clarity that, that happens where, oh, I can't get high anymore. And then, you know, they'll, they'll start putting the work in. So by, by, uh, 42, uh, I had, I had, uh, I had been clean. Uh, and actually I had a, a daughter on the way, uh, I've, I've had two more kids since then as well. And, and I was in a fantastic loving, uh, relationship, um, by, uh, and, and here I am at, at 51, getting to speak in front of, um, uh, an incredible, uh, group of people with an incredible organization that you're, uh, leading and help lead. Uh, and, and I get to run a business accelerator. And we've done things like put cameras on the International Space Station. We've built artificial intelligence uh, for machine vision. And uh, we've uh, we built the, the Kodak image rights management system. Uh, we own the oldest uh, commercial drone operating uh, manufacturing company in the world. And, and, and I would say the list goes on, but the list goes on. Most excitingly, we get to work with entrepreneurs on a daily basis with the platform that we have that helps them determine what's most important and how to get it done. Basically, a very step-by-step -step process of, of like, how do you do it possible? The, the main realization that I was very fortunate to be served in terms of how people do impossible, and we've all done impossible. We all do impossible almost every single day. If we think about what it's like, you know, we're getting kids ready for school in the morning. We've got, like, we just, we just completely and totally overload and overwhelm ourselves, whether it's financial overburden, whether it's family overburden, whether it's personal expectations, whether it's relationships, whether it's career, whether it's whatever, we're all tend to be striving for something that's completely unrealistic. And we all tend to think that all that perfection has to happen consistently all the time. 
as, as to maybe opposed to understanding or taking a belief system that says that, you know, the quote unquote imperfection that's happening all the time is what's perfect. So we, we all go through it. Like, how are we going to pay that bill this month? And somehow we do it, right? How are we going to get that? You know, how are we going to get through, you know, our studies to get that next degree or to get our doctorate or to get our, you know, and, and somehow we do it. How are we going to get our kids through school? How are we going to get them through an illness? How, you know, like we, I've had a, a couple of siblings that have lost their children and how do they get through that? It's impossible. It's absolutely, but we do it. The formula for doing it is really quite simple. And how I stumbled through it or onto it was um, there was a period when I was when I was uh, deep, deep, deep in my addiction, and uh, I was running uh, from a gang uh, who was uh, I, I owed money, I owed all kinds of things, to and and I had to get from Vancouver uh, back to uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, where my brother was, uh, you know, hoping that he would take me, up, you know, again or one last time, and I had no identification. Uh, I had a, I had my own Jeep that I stole. It's, it's a story among itself. Um, and uh, and I was driving back to, I had no money. No, and, and in 10 days, somehow, going through withdrawals, everything else, I got from Vancouver to Lethbridge. I, I remember I begged for money. I remember I slept on the side of the road. I remember, I, I just, you just did it. But when I got back to my brother's place, he, he took me in. And I asked him, I said, uh, I said, why are you taking me in again? And, and, and I, I'd been making contact with an old business associate of mine who was, was literally sending me Western Union money, which I was somehow figuring out how to get without identification, $12 at a time. Because he, he, he knew even $12 was risky for me to have. And, uh, and, and, and I would borrow or beg for money and get some and get gas and get back. And so, and so, there, so my brother had a sense of some of the progress I was making back. And when I got there, you know, I, 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 you know, of course, I felt completely shame, shameful, and and I asked him. I said, "Why are you helping me?" And he said, "Because um, you got ten days clean." I I told the story a hundred times, and I still can't say that part without welling up. Having ten days clean at that point in my life was absolutely impossible. I couldn't get ten minutes clean. And the point being was I didn't start out to get 10 days clean. If I, if, if the beginning of that whole process, I would have said, Hey, listen, I'm, my goal is to get 10 days clean. I, it wasn't going to happen. I spent years trying to get one day clean at a time and couldn't do it. Right. But I had 10 days clean, but the reason I had, to, and then if I would even think further and go, you know, listen, in 12 years from now, I'm going to be living in California. I'm going to be able to work with incredible people. I'm going to have, you know, three beautiful kids at home, other kids, you know, they're graduating from school, a fantastic relationship. And it don't, I'm, don't, I'm not trying to paint like everything's perfect and rosy, believe me, there's like headaches and, you know, troubles and problems and challenges all day, every day. Uh, but if, 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 if that would have been my goal, I, it just, I, I, I wouldn't have gone after it. That wasn't, I, it just was in total impossibility. However, every little step, that I took in order to get that 10 days clean was only about the next minute in front of me. It was only about the next minute in front of me and the next minute in front of me. We tend to think, I tend to think, lots of us addicts to, and, and lots of homeless people who are in despair, that I know there's mental um, illness issues, but yet, you know, we tend to think about what all has to be done rather than what just has to be done right now. Right? And it takes an awful lot of faith just to do what needs to be done right now and not do what we're so conditioned to think about is how are we going to solve everything today? How is everything going to be perfect? How are we going to have total security? How are we going to have total fulfillment? How are we going to have complete relationship? You know, gaga, how, like it's just, it, we're not. So what I have found that works for me and the entrepreneurs that I get to work with uh, anyways, and, and, and the addicts and, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the homeless and the mentally challenged and everything else is just what's next. That's, that's the only thing really that we have to do. So while you set your big picture objective of, of really where you want to be, what I have found is that people that then move toward that as an expectation, that is all they will accomplish. And it will be a very difficult road to get there. 
And they may accomplish a part of it, but then sacrifice the other three quarters of their life or the other four fifths of their life in order to get that one piece. And then they're accused of not having balance in life. And they're, you know what I mean? And then all the other, you know, society shameful things come around it. As opposed to what we find to do, even with, with uh, personal um, objectives or with business objectives, is we set a five-year objective out there. This is the direction we're going to go. But in my philosophy, I know that the rest of the world thinks a lot bigger than I do. And if I do the things along that road that get me towards that five-year goal, the rest of the people that I get to work with, what we create together will always be bigger. It will be different, right? And it will always be better than actually what I would have imagined. Because when I imagine what I want, it's a self-centered position. It's just, it just is. It's just like, that's the context. It's like, it's first person. This is what I want to accomplish. As opposed to, hey, this is the vision, right? The, the word that you used in the introduction. This is the vision that I would like to have and try and get there and move toward. But let the rest of um, the energy that exists, the other people exist, share and build that vision. It, it may take a bit longer, but I have never, ever seen it not be 10 times as big as what anybody could expect. Right? Getting that first $12 at a Western Union was impossible. Right? Get, getting, you know, living in California, it, 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 off the beach and get, taking my kids to, to surfing in the mornings, like that was, that's a, like beyond, like a million times bigger than I could have imagined at that time. And, and, and so then we break it down into, okay, and, and then we'll talk about, okay, well, what's the one year look like? And we still keep the expectations fairly general. And then as we get closer and closer and closer, we'll do a 90 day of, uh, of you know, where we need to be, if that were going to happen. And then we'll do it for 30 days. And then really it gets down to what are the top three things today. And at the end of the day, we probably have, you know, 75 to 80 things that we all need to get done every single day, but like at minimum just to get back into bed the next night. And so I don't, I, listen, I know that I'm gonna do 75 to 80 things in a day and they're all really important, but there's three things that I always focus on that the, at the morning I get up, I do my, I do my meditation first thing in the morning. And then I, and before I look at email, before I get caught up in any kind of news or social media or anything like that at all, I'm in a great headspace and I just look at those three things. At the end of the day, if it's, if it's quarter to five, and I don't have, and I've, and I've got 150 things done in a day, but I don't have those three done. I'm, you know what I mean? I haven't really done what's important. And, and so it's just, so what I have found is that with any project that we build, it's, it really comes down to everybody's top three things in a day. I just get those next three things done. That's it. it. It really is, you know, quite frankly, that simple. And, and since that time, you, you know, the size of the projects that we get to work with, the, the types of people that we uh, get to work with. I, I mean, we just, we, just, we just have this little company. We just attracted Andy Carr to our board. Andy is the former White House chief of staff for eight years. I mean, this, I, I mean, this guy is, you know, has counseled presidents all over the world. We've got Jack Chow, who, who is the, the first deputy director of uh, the World Health Organization. I'm a kid from Southern Alberta, right? I have no education, right? And I get to, learn from these types of individuals simply and, and you know what they really appreciate you know another great individual is ed moy who ran the u.s um mint the only man to make it profitable and what he always appreciates about what we do is is that we don't get caught up in too much excitement we're, we're all passionate people but when he works with us and when we get to work with him it's always just about the next thing that needs to get done and you know what? it's a very grounding grounding thing that takes us out of ourselves. And, and puts us in a position where when we work as a team just to do the next thing, it actually becomes service work. So. Amazing. No, no. That, no, I, I, I was so looking forward and I, and I wanted to hold up a little card um, that said, uh, I, know what, I know what you went to the bank to draw out $12, you know? And I remember that because it doesn't seem like a lot of money. And it's almost like, why would you go to the bank to ask for $12? And I actually shared your TEDx talk with my 13-year-old son. Because I'm like, I want you, while you're home, I gave the message, I said, this is one thing I want you to do. When you are not going to school every day, I want you to learn from other extraordinary leaders that have been tested for purpose that have struggled and come through the other side. 
that is the gift that I want to give him. So I said, I would love for you to sit down. And he was like, so he watched the TED talk. Like he dismisses a lot what I say, like a lot. <laughs> 13 and like mom says this, he'll do that. But it took him a little bit. He says, ah, mom wants me to watch. And then I started playing it. And then I just handed it to him and he was so interested because, you know, and I talk about you started your journey of entrepreneurship when you're 14. That's incredible, right? So I think your journey and I think that your path is so inspiring because you didn't have all the luxuries that, and privilege that other people have had. But I think that is what's made you to be such the remarkable, inspiring story that you are because you've had the challenges. You're relatable to a lot of people, right? You're relatable to mm. everybody, but not at the same time. Like nobody to be tested like you've been tested is for purpose, I truly believe. Yeah. And I love that it's big because that's all I believe is big. <laughs> I'm like a big vision thinker. And people say, you think too big. And I'm like, I only found one person said, you don't think big enough. And, and she became my coach. Because <laughs> yeah. everybody says, you think too big. And I'm like, no. She goes, you don't think big enough. You know, so I love, love how you're supporting people in that space of learning and growth and, and caring that anything is possible. I love, love, love the top three. Why make it complicated? Focus on the top three. Like those sound so easy to do, but actually to have the discipline to do them and to be very clear on your vision and focused on it and then throw everything else away, right? Just be good to people. Yeah, the, 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 a few, a few things. First of all, whoever your coach is, she's, she's brilliant. You don't think big enough. I can tell you right now. And I think you're a big thing. Oh, oh, we have to have a conversation because I think pretty big. We're, we're going to yeah. have a, we're going to have a green room chat cam. Just Amazing. saying. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, I promise you, no matter how big anybody thinks what, what, what is possible and what actually happens in the world is so much like, no, I don't need to tell everybody, you know, it's just so much bigger than what we could even remotely remotely comprehend and and you know i think we live in a relative universe so the bigger we think you know it's like the smaller we have to act it's like the bigger the things that we're going to do the smaller the increments we have to take because it's too overwhelming and the self-doubt is too big and so these things aren't just about you know what do i need to do physically but what do i need to do mentally the bigger i think the smaller my ego needs to be like it is a hundred percent relevant that if you're going to do great things like if you if you want to be a part of great things, then you add, you just need to do the little things, and it's it's really tough because in the middle is the busy work, in the middle is where we get to avoid feeling, in the middle is where we don't actually have to, uh, uh, wh where we can have self pity and victimhood. In the middle is where we can say, oh, I'm so busy, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Well, no wonder I can't get to that. But like, you no. Know, when I, when all I have to do is the three things in a day and I don't get those done, there's only one person I have to look at the mirror. I can't blame anybody. I can't victimhood myself. I can't do anything. It's three simple things. And if I just do those three simple things, I also give my, myself permission to think as big as I want. It's that middle section that's so dangerous for us where we just get lost in busyness and, and all the stuff that just helps, that, that helps us avoid the real things that we need to do with those things those three little things that, that, that just happen all the time that we could just do. Well, I just want to say I'm extremely grateful for you to share your journey with us and for all of the viewers. And I said this last time, I, I I'm used to looking out into the audience. Oh, uh, I bet. Yeah. Just it's just crazy. Intimate, just you and me here. Yeah. I'm having this interview and I want to say, um, I'm, I'm thankful because I know how busy you are doing all the things, those great things that you're doing in the world. And so I want to be there to support you. I, I think oh, vice versa. many conversations that we're going to have to have because yeah. I love your, your values, um, your drive, your passion, it, you know, it's, it's so in line with everything that we do and to support female entrepreneurs to step up and, and say, yes, Monica, I will support you. Thanks to, Calvin Krusty, because he was the one that did the wonderful in, um, intro. And uh, so thanks, Cal, for the He's a intro. gentleman. He's yeah. such a gentleman. Yeah. Another support her. He's on our yeah. panel tomorrow, I have to say. Right. Super excited. He's a remarkable man. So I just feel totally blessed to have you in the community. I encourage everyone 
please let us know. I want to hear your top takeaways from the talk. Cameron Shell at Cameron Shell at Twitter. Send us a note. I want to hear the takeaways. Show us the love here. It's hard to see because you can't see people clap. I think you, I'm going to give you a standing ovation. Yeah, well, vice versa, believe me, on your whole effort, on everything that you're doing. And I can tell you, it's it's creating an impact and there's a great buzz around it. Maybe you can't feel it as much there. But I, it's not, yeah, I feel it. Like, I, like just like, all, like just it, it, the online work, everything that was coming through. It's just, been, it's fantastic. You're impacting a lot of people. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And I look forward to enjoying that when we're offline, but mm -hmm. right now I'm present with you and that's my focus. So thank you so much for joining us, Cam. And I look forward to the journey ahead. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.